and I think we'll begin. And uh, as always, the way at least I've been taught to study Torah is to figure out how to bring it into your life. Because Torah is Malash and Hara'ah. Torah is not just a great complicated book, but something it's a, it's a guiding book, it's a guiding force. The original um, uh, self help, maybe as you would say it, but a little more complex. The, you know, besides for the halachic uh, interpretations that come out, you have also the Kabbalist Hasidic insights. It's all rooted based on the five books of Moses. And this week's Torah portion, we have Bishalach. We have a real doozy, as they say. One of the most wild experiences that even non-believers or people who are, don't know much about the Bible have heard. If you say, if you ask your average person on the street, you know, what do you know about the Bible? Or what's the most outrageous thing you know about the Bible? Chances are that splitting of the sea is right up there. So, for example, I mean, just the fact that the most practice experience in the Jewish calendar is a Passover Seder. And of course, we have the splitting of the seas there as well, which of course is coming from this week's Torah portion. So it actually has its own name, this Shabbat, it's called Shabbat Shira. It's a time of singing. And uh, there's a lot that went on over there, a lot of drastic interpretations and commentaries that are all wild and interesting. But there is a question before we get to the interesting part of the splitting of the sea. First, I also want to mention that tonight is also begins. There's four different Rosh Hashanahs. We are all familiar with the main one, which is on Rosh Hashanah, which is, you know, the one that we go to Sholin or back in the other day. And then we also have what's called Tu Bishvat. Tu Bishvat is the 15th Shvat, which is the Rosh Hashanah for the trees. Um, by a raise of hands... Have you heard of Rosh Hashanah Le'ilanot or Tu B'Shvat? Raise your hand. Just so I have an idea of what's going on. Okay. So for those who haven't, you have some homework to do after the class. You can go right on Google or Sepharia or any of these places, Chabad.org, probably the best site that I know of. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the holiday of Rosh Hashanah with regards to the trees, Tu B'Shvat. So the fact that we are right now in the portion of Bishalach, and we have the splitting of the sea, which is the big one, and we also have two bishvat. Towards the end of the class, we'll try to bring it all together and see how that, you know, all meshes into hopefully a guiding point for all of us. So, L'chaim, we'll begin. This coffee, no worries. I'm not going too far anyways. All right. So the first thing we want to discover is in the name of the portion... There's always something very special. Now, that's why it has its name. There's only 52 portions, and there's only 52 names of the portions. So whatever the por portion is, like, for example, next week we'll get into it, for those who want to join us, is Yisro, and that's the giving of the Torah. And it begs the question, why is Yisro the name of the portion? Maybe the name of the portion has been the giving of the Torah. You think that's bigger than Yisro, who was a convert, who practiced every sort of idol worship in the world. Yes, at the end, he becomes Moses' father-in-law, which is a big deal. But to have your own portion, it's like, you know, the top 50, the top 50 in the NBA, the top 50 in the NFL. It's only so many 50, there's only so many people that can make that list. So the fact that someone makes that list or some name makes that list is obviously a very significant purpose and a significant reason. So this week's Torah portion is called Bishalach. Now, Bishalach means to send out. But who was sending out? Bishalach over here refers to Pharaoh. That's how the verse starts off in this week's Torah portion, that Pharaoh sends out this nation. So why are we giving emphasis on Pharaoh sending out the Jews? Maybe we should have called this week's Torah portion splitting of the sea. Or Shira. I mean, we call it Shabbat Shira. It has another name to it because it's such a significant Torah portion. But the actual name of the Torah portion that we read is called Bishalach. So that's a good question that we'll have to come to as well. Well, let's start off with that question, and let's see if we can knock it down, and then we'll get into some other questions and, and come back to it. The Hasidic masters say that the reason why we refer to Pharaoh's expression of sending out the Jews, Bishalach, is, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, based on that question, it's almost derogatory. It's as if the, the Jews didn't want to leave. So he had to send them out. Once he allows them to go free, why would he have to send them out? 
they should be running for the hills. They're, they're done. 210 years of slavery is enough. So obviously there's more going on to this. It's not so simple that it means that Pharaoh's not What it is is really it's setting a precedent and setting a tone as the Jews are just about to leave and gain their freedom. You see, most of us and most people in the world, and especially the Jews at that time, when we do something or when we need to do something, it's out of functionality. We need to get up in the morning. We need to, We have a job. We need to show up on time. We have a Zoom class. Shabbos is coming. Even the most religious of them, they're preparing. There's a certain level of diligence and functionality that goes. So obviously, if you are a slave for 210 years, you pray to God or you pray, or do whatever you can that you should be free. Why? Because no one wants to be a slave. That's functional. That's not necessarily passion. Passion is once you are free already, now you want to discover what you really want. You know, everybody knows they don't want to be beholden to someone else. No one wants to be a slave to a pharaoh. But once you take off the shackles and once you let them free, now what do you want? Now what's your real worth? What's your real passion? Where do you want to go? You know, it's like people ask themselves a question like, if they won the lotto, what would they do? Would they still keep their job? You know, that's always a big question. Lotto's hit recently to close to a billion dollars. These conversations start to perkle up again. What does that mean? So most people see finance as a, you know, a certain limitation. But if I had no limitations, what would I be? What would I want to do? Until then, okay, there's certain things that I need to do with my life in order to achieve a certain amount of wealth so I can have a certain functional level that works for me, for my standard, my style. So once the Jews were freed, they began a new passion of what it is that they wanted in life. It wasn't just about leaving Pharaoh anymore. They now entered into a whole new space, and we'll talk about that as we get to the splitting of the sea, the manna, the whole experience in the desert, the receiving of the Torah, becoming partners with God, with the Creator, with the Infinite. That's a whole nother party. That's not just, I want to leave my jail cell. This is a whole nother, you know, um, attitude in terms of how to affect and change the entire world. That created a, a tremendous amount of passion. So we say that compared to where the Jews were going, it was Bishalach. That's what we want to say is that Pharaoh, was, Pharaoh sent them out compared to where they were going. Of course they wanted to leave, but compared to the passion that they had for the goals that they wanted to achieve and being God's partner in making this world a better place, you couldn't compare the idea of leaving. So that would be this, this, the tone setter in terms of how they're going to be. So that's where they were, they were merited to all these miracles. Like even in this thing, the sea, if you read the commentaries, it's completely wild. Maybe we'll touch upon some of those soon. And so when we think of it in, in those terms, maybe then we can have a certain appreciation of why we call it Bishalach. He sends them out, not that it's derogatory, but this is the beginning of the impetus of truly finding their freedom, of not just leaving or wanting to leave because you don't like the shackles. The shackles are gone. And now what happens? There's another also idea on this Torah portion is what is the greatest goal in terms of advancing one's own spiritual journey is that we take the things that slow us down and they work for us. It's called transformation, okay, or transcendence. So Pharaoh was the one that was holding them back. Now Paro is, oh, now Paro is sending them out. Pharaoh is not working for them. He's not no, It's not just that he lets them go. He's pushing them out. He's already changed his tone. He's changed completely. He's now working for them, so to speak. So that's a, a real level of the beginning of the transformation of where the Jews are headed and what's going to happen to them. Okay. Now we're going to get to the next level. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to take you through the journey. So now that they left, Pharaoh sends them out. There's a lot of commentary and ideas. I can't share them all, but I want to share the idea of the splitting of the sea. Why is the splitting of the sea so integral to the Jewish story, to the leaving of Exodus? It's, it, I mean, you know, I went to Disneyland with my kids. They even have, you know, part of the exhibition and it's a small world. They have, you know, this idea of splitting the sea. How did it become so big? Why did it become so big? What was God's purpose for it? What was the reason for it? I mean, there was no Ubers running around then in the desert. They, splitting of the Red Sea, that was the only way they can get to Mount Sinai. I mean, if, if, if the wings of birds came by, like a Spielberg movie, and they got on, that would maybe be less crazy. 
why do we have to go to such crazy extremes of such a wild miracle to be somewhat of the precursor in order to receive the Torah? So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty, and so much so that everybody knows the story of the splitting of the Red Sea. And there's a lot on it. There's a lot of commentaries. Just Google splitting the Red Sea, go to Chabad.org. You can educate yourself. It's endless. This, if you want to do a deep sea driving, the splitting of the sea. And what happens before the splitting of the sea? There's different factions and they fight and they argue. And one says we should go back. And one says we should commit suicide until one guy jumps in. And then the sea splits. And as a sea splits, they go to 12 different tribes have told 12 different channels within the sea. And the, and, the, and as we'll read on this week's Torah portion, and the, and the wall stood straight on the right and on the left. An elaborate detail experience of 600,000 primary souls, 2 million altogether, walking through what was at one point a wetlands, and now it's dry. It says even more so that the miracles were so wild that the ground that they wanted, you would think it'd be muddy. No, it was dry where the Jews went. And then afterwards, it talks about as the Jews make it almost to the end, and the Egyptians are, are, are following them, then the sea washes back up and drowns all the Egyptians out. This, what's this whole thing with the sea? <laughs> Why couldn't they have a boat? How hard is it, you know, find a boat? Wouldn't it be easier? A little bit maybe less traumatic? So obviously, we know everything in Torah has multi-layered and multi-reasons. And I'm going to share with you some teachings from some of the great Hasidic masters about the splitting of the sea. It says that they entered the sea on dry land. That's from the verse in this week's Torah portion. The Talmud has a tremendous quote, and it says, every creature exists on lands, and for every creature that exists on land has a counterpart in the sea. Okay? Again, for everything that exists on dry land, there's a counterpart in the sea. We know the world is two-thirds water and one-third dry land. So it's easy to conceive that certainly there's room and space for that. So the Kabbalists call it something called Alma de Iskasia and Alma de Iskaya, the world that's hidden and the world that's revealed. Two different worlds. There are things that are obvious. Right now, even though there's Zoom, I can see you. You can see me if you want. And that's revealed. And there's hidden. There's stuff going on behind the scenes, things that I think about, perhaps you think about. And then the have, there's always two different faces of the coin, things that are revealed and things that are hidden. Things that I share, thoughts that come through my mind and outside my mouth that now you hear, and maybe thoughts that never come out. Maybe that sometimes I'm aware of them, sometimes I'm not. Alma de Scalia, Alma de Scalia, revealed and hidden. Well, our world is also comprised of revealed and hidden. The dry land would be obviously the revealed part. The wetlands, ocean, if you ever got a chance to take a, a sea voyage, it's fascinating. It's extremely humbling. You don't know how deep it goes sometimes, even with the, all the sonar equipment. And there's lots of stuff going on there that we'll never know about, species that we'll never even discover. So that's the hidden world. So we say there's actually two aspects of our personalities, as I've been explaining, is hidden and revealed. And the difference is as follows. You see, in the ocean, a fish, for example, can never fool itself in thinking that it, it can be on the dry land. It knows it's constantly emerged in the water because once it leaves, it'll die. So it knows that its life, its, its, its terrain, its existence needs to be always in the ocean, in the water. But there are species that are on the land that sometimes are hidden. They create burrows. They are not visible for long periods of time. Could be several months, several seasons. And they can fool themselves in thinking that they don't need to be on this you know, dry land. They can think that, fool themselves in thinking that it's their own existence. The, the, the fish never fools himself. The fish never always knows that it needs its environment and its surroundings in order to exist. As soon as you take a fish out of water, it jumps and wants to go back. But the human being doesn't quite have the same sort of loyalty and de or overt dependence on the world that it's in. Of course, it needs the oxygen. Of course, it needs trees, and we'll get to that real soon. And it needs a lot of things, but it doesn't always... It's not always aware of that. It's not always conscious of that. And it can may walk an entire lifetime absolutely believing and thinking that it doesn't need this. So it's a higher level of consciousness, so to speak, between the aquatic system and the earth, the dry land. So stay with me. I'll bring it all home, I promise. 
but I could think I think you can see where I'm going with this. So what happens? Welcome, Reb Ruvain. Um, so 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 we're, we're just talking about the power of the splitting of the sea and why this is such a critical miracle and why it had to happen. So what does God do? God says, "I'm going to show you, and I want you to experience what it means when I reveal the world which is hidden." And I want you to experience it. I want you to walk through it. I want you to realize that it's possible for you to absolutely emerge yourself in this world that's normally covered, Alma de Is Gassia, this hidden world. And you can still find existence there. You can still be at yourself. It was a very, very unique experience that they had. Um, we know that Moses, Moses' his name is what? Moshe. Why is it called Moshe? Because he was drawn from water. Water is, again, reflective of this, the spiritual experience. And that's why it's called Moshe. We know that when Jacob blesses his grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons, what does he say to them? I want you to swim like the fish in the midst of the land. To have a certain consciousness and know that you're always in the spiritual cocoon guiding you, even though you're on the land. And in order for us to really be God's partner in this world by receiving the Torah... He first needs to take us through the splitting of the sea and showing us that it's possible for even us to be able to see a world that sometimes seems hidden, sometimes seems a little bit, you know, covered. We don't always understand all the secrets, but to know that there's a navigational experience by a higher power all the time is what can completely anchor us into a much deeper, richer existence. So we all sort of to speak had to go through this mikvah process, although we didn't have to get wet because it was dry. The walls were on both sides. And that's when we go ahead and have this experience of having a bird's, having a, a peak, so to speak, into this world that's hidden. And finally, on this idea, and then we'll go to Tuba Shvat and bring it together. Finally, it says that when will the error of Mashiach come? When will the redemptive state come? Or what is that supposed to look like? What is that experience? I know it's weird and it sounds, but the fact is, no matter what shul you sing is, Osha Shalom Bim Ramav, when you sing that song, you sing Sheyabana, Shemay all these things lead to a world of utopian error, a world of redemptive error. And what does it say there? It says in Isaiah, it says, Umal Ha'aretz, Deya Es Hashem, Kamayim Layom Mechasim. Umal arts and it will fill up the world. Deya es Hashem with the knowledge of God. Kamayim layom nechasim, just as the water covers over the seabed. So when we get into an experience that we can start to see the world, not just for its physical or um, ability that's hiding from us, but when we can able to see it with those a uh, submarine sort of speak, you know, ability where we can see through the water and see what's going on around us and recognize for everything we see, there's something for everything that's created. There has to be a creator by definition. And when we start to live our lives like that, that's when we start to experience the splitting of the Red Sea, even several thousand years later. And that's what Hashem wants to do to the Jewish people. He says, not only were you, I'm taking you out of freedom. I'm going to show you, I'm going to roll back the tape, so to speak, or, or, or pull back the curtain, as they say, and show you how things really operate. And that's why we, water is so integral to the experience and splitting of the Red Sea. Now, I want to do a quick tie into Tu Bishvat, and then I'm going to have Reuben take over. Tu Bishvat, as we know, is the Rosh Hashanah for the trees. And even though the, there's, there's no fruits growing on outside, like why are we celebrating the trees? Maybe we should wait till they're actually picking the fruits off the trees. And we say very, something very interesting over here. That wall, the fruits aren't visible and growing, but below the surface, the sap is rising. The life force begins to ascend from the earth to the trunk and then the fruits. Then trees are preparing to unleash their inner reserves and shower us with magnificent buds and blossoms. It may be that things look desperate and bleak. Still, the inner dimensions of the trees are building up for the renewal. For whatever reason, the rabbis decided this is the point between not necessarily that you get to go ahead and, and take a bite out of the apple, but where movement starts to begin that even though we don't see it. And so we talk about the Rosh Hashanah of trees really represents our ability 
to recognize something greater than just what meets the eye, but where it's coming from, kind of similar to the splitting of the Red Sea. By recognizing fruits, by eating fruit from the tree, and we have this special meaning, we are connecting to a higher power, a seed that sometimes doesn't appear like dirt, but ultimately it can grow into the ground, and from there it can come a tree, from their branches, from their, their fruit, etc. One last idea about the Tubishvat, and you can see already the time between what is hidden and what is revealed, starts to reveal itself through Tubishvat. That's an immediate connection between the splitting of the sea and, and the holiday. But I saw something also that uh, from the Kabbalists, I think it was um, from Rabbi Isaac Luria. He talks about that a tzaddik is compared to an inverted tree. What does it mean an inverted tree? His roots are in heaven, okay? And he slowly gets powered, so to speak, powered down here. And the fruits he gives off here into the world. Think of a tree upside down, right? So in many, many ways, that's really what all of us can try to accomplish and recognize just as a physical tree is able to grab its source and its nourishments from the physical ground in order to give off fruits in our physical experience above surface, we all can also tap into a higher place of our spiritual nutrients in order to build ourselves up so that we can go ahead and share our own fruit with each other. Anytime we share Torah with each other, every time we listen to something, we're benefiting. There's a fruit that's being digested, not just by ourselves, but somewhere, somewhere else. Obviously, these are, this is very layered stuff. And, and uh, you know, procreation, obviously, is the more obvious one. But we want to talk about there is fruit that's being created, but just simply by sharing Torah with each other. So may we merit to really, I'll conclude by, by a blessing, may we merit to walk through the splitting of the sea, recognize how the navigation of the mysterious of God's ways. May we prepare to receive the Torah by next week. May we make the world a better place. May we see that even though things seem a little bleak, but there's still something that's brewing under the surface. And let us pray that it continues to push itself out completely so that we can benefit from this amazing, wonderful world that Hashem has given us. Everybody get vaccinated. Let's get out there and party soon. L'chaim, everybody. Happy Rosh Hashanah. Reb Ruvain, sorry. Welcome, welcome. Well, wonderful. You covered a lot of material. Um, my presentation will probably be, will probably be a little bit fishy, less fishy than yours. <laughs> <clears throat> but I think if we cross the sea together, we will see the convergence between three amazing events on a single day. This is not only Tu Bishvat, this is also the International Holocaust Day. And the um, convergence between the world, not the Jews, we have our own Yom HaShoah, but that the world is commemorating that the tragedy which happens to the Jews is seen as a world tragic event, not just an event to the Jews. Turns out on the day in which we rebuild for the future, which is Tu Bishvat. Not only the amazing interpretation is given to us by Mesh, but people don't realize that three major institutions in Israel, the Technion, the Hebrew University, and the Knesset, the cornerstone was all, as it were, planted on Tu Bishvat. It's remarkable. So Tu Bishvat is really a day of rebuilding. Also, of course, we're now commemorating the next week coming up, Bishamach, which is our original uh, redemption. So I want to talk about the Song of the Sea, how it was done, and its significance. This is the only song in the whole Torah that is sung by everybody. Only example, Shira. The only disagreement was, how is it to be sung? So there are three positions upon this. And the, one says that Moshe said the first line, and everybody repeated with him. Oh, boy, they didn't know it, so they repeated what he said. The other is that Moshe said the first line, and everybody repeated the same thing all the time, like Zekeli van Vehu. That is a refrain, like we say on Shabbat. We go through the whole story of the history of the Jews in the Bible. And after each line, we say, Hashem ki tov, ki Meaning, the, the, the uh, Chazan says one thing. And we all respond with the exact same line as he goes through the whole song. The third approach was that Moshe Rabbeinu said the first line. We said the second line. Moshe Rabbeinu said the third line. We said the fourth line. And on. Mainly, like many synagogues do, Az Yashir. I mean, not Az Yashir, Anim Zmirot. Meaning, it's done responsively. Together, we say everything. But nobody says all. 
and therefore we create a song only by the cooperation of the leader and the people. There's even a fourth theory mentioned in Yakut Ruveni, a Kabbalistic work of the 16th or 17th century, who argued that the responsive was between the men and the women. Because Miriam, when she took up the, the timbre and the dr drums, it says, Vata'an Lahem. Lahem is to them in the masculine, not Vata'an Lahen, which would be the plural feminine. So he argues it wasn't a choir of women. But rather, the men said the first line, and the women responded. And therefore, it was a chorus between men and women. So we have three mentions, three ways of doing it, according to rabbinic literature. It's primarily the Tosefta. And one way, according to a Kabbalist of the 17th century, that it was a joint choir of men and women, Moshe leading the men, and his older sister, Miriam, leading the women. And interesting, in the Torah, after Abraham, the two people who are known as Nevi'im are Moshe and Miriam. The reason I mentioned Nevi'im being a prophet here, because they had to be able to predict what line was coming up, which means they had to know it in advance. Of course, we sing the whole song. If you go to a Sephardic synagogue, which is a good thing to do in general, the whole Az Yashir is said by the whole congregation, right? In most Ashkenazic synagogues, they like to mumble it through. And many an Ashkenazic prayer has been saved by her mutter. But the Sephardim say the whole thing together. In fact, there's an excellent synagogue in Brookline. You may want to frequent once in a while. But if you do, come early enough to can participate in the communal singing of the Az Yashir. It's worth the price of admission, especially when there is no price of admission. Anyhow, I want to show you to what degree the song is to remind and make you feel like you're there. So if you have a chumash and you can find the actual text, you'll find this a lot easier. Otherwise, listen. But we're on chapter 15 of Exodus. We sing the song. <clears throat> and I want to focus upon the, the presentation of Pharaoh and how real it is. So if you look at chapter 15 of the book of Exodus, it starts off in verse 9. Tet. You can also find it online. Just go to Sepharia, go to Tanakh, go to Chumash or Torah, go to the book of Exodus, Shmot, either English or Hebrew or both, and find chapter 15, verse 9. Starts off saying, Amar Oyev. I should say Amar Paro. But Paro is not just the king. Paro is totally perceived now as the enemy. He does nothing want to do but to kill you. In the meantime, Amar begins with an aleph. Oyev begins with an aleph. The next three words, erdof, asig, achalek, all begin with an aleph. So we have five alephs. And the aleph, when you say aleph, as opposed to saying mem, you have to open your mouth. You have to open your mouth wide. So he says, amar oyev, erdof, asig, achalek, shalal. Now this is Pharaoh talking. I'm going to run after you. I'm going to catch up with you. And I'm going to what? Split the spoil. Now watch the beat. If you can almost hear the beat. And if you can't hear the beat, you should come to Beit Avraham and Shabbat morning to listen to it on a regular basis. There it says, Erdof, two syllables. I will pursue Erdof, Asig, Achalek, Shangal, Teyemulema, Nafshi, Orik, Kharbi, Torishema, Yadi, D, D, D. You can almost feel the hot air of Pharaoh breathing down your neck. And you realize, he says, I'm going to kill you guys. And he says the phrase, mo nafshi, my nefesh, which means my gullet, my throat, will be full of them. Who's them? The people of Israel. It's almost like he wants to swallow us up alive. And then it says, Arik kharbi, tori shema yadi, I will unsheathe my sword and I will destroy them. Against who's them? Israel. And both times it's mo, mo, mo. Mo refers to Israel. Mo, mo, mo. Then, remarkably, the next four words, you feel fear at you. You feel the knife at the back of your neck. Within a second, you expect to be dead. And right at that moment of expectation of death, the next verse says, Nashafta, Baruchacha. And you puffed with your breath, right? Just God puffed. Here's Pharaoh at the top of the, top of the, of the, the sea, looking down at Israel, coming down at them, 
willing to kill them, unsheathing his sword, pointed at them, and suddenly what happens? With a puff of air, nashafta. Now, the word nashafta makes you breathe. Say nashafta. If you say the word nashafta, you have to breathe out. The word no shaf, no shame in Hebrew, is like inhale, exhale. Except the words are almost anamarpeyak. They make you enact the feeling behind it. Nashafta, baruchacha, with your breath. Kisamo yam, and the sea covered them. And what's the word for them? Again, mo. So we have the word mo three times. Mo, mo, mo. The first two refer to Israel. The third refer to Egypt. So if you look at it, it's remarkable. Pharaoh says, I will kill Mo, meaning what? Israel. I will swallow them up alive, meaning what? Israel. Then it says, and God, you puffed with your air, and the waters covered Mo. Who's Mo now? Them. It's almost like a midah kenege midah. As Pharaoh meant to do to Israel, so was done to him. That's called midah kenege midah, or as Shakespeare would say, measure for measure. But in the meantime, you can feel it. And if you didn't get those words, the next three words really spell it out. It says, Tsalalu, Kofer B'mayim Adirim. They went down like lead. But they went down, the Hebrew words, Tsalalu. Okay, what does it sound like? Tsalalu. So if you're in water and you're drowning in water, you will gasp for breath. When you grasp for breath, what do you say? La, 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 la. So the word imitates the sound. They're drowning in the sea. They're gasping in the breath. And you can hear the Egyptians saying, la, 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 trying to gasp for breath. And as they gasp for their last breath, what do they do? They sink like lead into the earth. Now, if you were there at this event and you went <clears throat> from the greatest fear you could possibly have, which is the fear of death, to that moment of salvation and being saved almost literally by the skin of your teeth, and you attributed this wondrous event to God, what would you say? You would say exactly what they said in the next line. Mi chamocha, Hashem. There's no God like you. Mi kamocha, There's Mi kamocha is clearly the communal response. So when the song was sung, when the song was sung, they enacted it out. And either was unresponsively. But when it came to Mi kamocha, that everybody said together, that is the joint response because they all were saved. They experienced the salvation. When we read the song, it's reenacted. So what do people respond? Mi chamocha. And everybody today, when you sing this song, even if you say it to yourself, when you come to the line, verse 11, mi kamocha, who is like you, you should sing it out loud as if you were what? Saved. Because if you were saved, you express your gratitude for the Savior. If you don't feel you were saved because you didn't undergo the experience, there's no sense of gratitude. Therefore, no expression of gratitude to the Savior. Then, the song goes on, <laughs> remarkably, with four words, which talk about natita, nachita, nehauta. <clears throat> all four words begin, are four letters, all begin with the letter nun. Talking about God directed us through the waters to the land of Israel, with a stopover at Sinai, called the Migdash. Most people refer to the word Mikdash. They think we mean the temple. But many commentators say it's not the temple in Yerushalayim. It was at Sinai. Because Sinai was a holy territory when God's revelation took place. So the interesting debate among commentators is the end goal of the song. Reaching Eretz Yisrael. Establishing Yerushalayim. And constructing the Mikdash or the temple. And when it says the word kadosh or mikdash, it means the temple. Or is the goal of leaving the Exodus arriving at Sinai? And Sinai was temporarily like a mikdash. That's where God's presence was felt. Later on, God's presence was transferred to the Mishkan. And from the Mishkan, it was transferred to the mikdash. It's a fascinating debate. It's a wonderful debate having in the Seder. What is the goal of the Exodus? Is the goal of the Exodus coming into the land of Israel and establishing the temple? Or is the goal of the Exodus coming to Sinai and receiving the Torah? It comes down to a major debate. What is the most significant thing in Judaism? Torah or temple? 
Was it the Mikdash or was it the Torah? There's no reason of answering one is right or one is wrong, but the enriching of both of them will enrich the conversation. So the function of the song is to get us to feel it. Now, the last line therefore ends, Adonai Yimloch Le'alam Va'ed. Now, the word Yimloch is frequently translated in English as God will rule. But biblical Hebrew does not have past, present, and future. Biblical Hebrew has only what is called perfect and imperfect. Perfect means the action is completed. Imperfect means the action is not yet completed. So Yimloch does not mean he will rule. It means God will continue to rule from present to the future. It doesn't mean that God only rules in the future. But God Yimloch will continue to rule. So if this is correct, either the song was sung responsively, of which there are three ways of doing it, as I mentioned. Either we repeat what Moshe says, either we repeat the same thing and Moshe goes through all the lines, or the third one, like Anim Zimirot, Moshe says one line, we say another line, Moshe says three, we say four, he says line five, we say line six. In any case, Everybody agrees the communal response was said by everybody. What are the two communal responses? Mi kamocha and Adonai yimloch elam v'ed. So mi kamocha means there's no God like our God. And Hashem yimloch elam v'ed means God will continue to rule forever. And most people say that is the meaning of the Shema. When we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. What does it mean to say God is one? Is the word one in contrast to two? In other words, is it against polytheism? You say there are many gods, and we say there's only one God. That's one interpretation. Second interpretation is the word Echad means miyuchad, nothing like it, incomparable, unique. There may be all the types of little puny gods running around the world, but the only God who, rule, who rules the world is our God, Echad, unique. And if therefore it's comparable to the phrase, Mi kamocha, who is like are you among the gods? And what's the answer? Nobody. God is singular. God is unique. There's nothing like it. The second interpretation is that Echad refers to the verse in Zechariah. Zechariah, and he quotes the Midrash. I mean, the Midrash quotes Zechariah. Which says when we say Hashem Echad, we mean Vaya Adonai Lamelech Al Koharitz, Vayomahu Ya Adonai Echad, Ushmo Echad. That is, the day will come when God will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Now, what do you mean his name one? Does that mean his proper name? Like my name is Ruvain, God's name is Echad. Or does it mean that when God is king or ruler of the whole universe, that all will call upon God? That means God is one for all. Because everybody will call him what? The one God. So if you take it that way, this is how the Midrash takes it. Hashem Elokeinu That means present reality. God is our God. Hashem Echad is future expectation. We look forward to the day when God's rulership will be universally recognized. When God's rulership is universally recognized, then we say what? So these two ideas are contained in the Az Yashir. First, Mika is a statement of God's uniqueness, God's singularity. There's nothing like it. Even if there are ancient gods, nothing is like what? Our God. The other is, it's not the idea of God's singularity. But we're looking for the day when the single God will be recognized by all. And all humanity will worship God, not just Israel. So Israel is the model. We are the avant-garde in the recognition of one God. But we hope that all humanity will join us. And when that happens, we say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. We're reflecting present reality and future expectation.
Okay, good. Anyhow, that summarizes. My wife is telling me that my voice is not coming through clearly. If you cannot hear me at all, please raise your hand. We hear you fine. Oh, you heard me fine. Oh, some of you can hear me. It's fine. You can find an echo. Chava, Chava, I could say that 99% of the time you're right, but this time we hear Reb Ruven perfectly clear. Okay, good. It's my, it's my computer. Okay. Could be. I'm just giving you honest feedback. Here. Okay. But good to hear you. Well, any, any the advantage of being married is you always get to hear an echo. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so that, that's, that's we've understood why the Az Yashir and the Song of the Sea is so significant that the whole song is sung every single day in the Psuki de Zimra. And in some congregations, it is sung on Shabbat. Therefore, really making it the only song in all of Tanakh, which is sung by the whole Jewish people, or at least recited, and part of the daily service. In that sense, it's almost as significant as the Ashrei, which is said three times a day. But even the Ashrei, the main idea is Machutacha, Machut Kolamim, that God's kingship lasts forever, which is another way of saying, Adana Yimloch, Le'alam Vo'ed. So may God reign forever and ever, and it's our hope that that reign will be universally recognized. Ayashikoyach. Um, Chav, I noticed that your mute button is off. So maybe if you shut your mute off, you'll hear, you know, you'll hear your sound better, but we'll try it. Okay, either way, let me know if it works. I don't claim to be any techie person. So I wanted to say, uh, first of all, just a quick comment, and if it's okay, and we'll open it up to some questions. The idea of having Shema embedded the way you shared um, in the Shiro is fantastic. And I just wanted to add one great teaching about the Shema which I'm sure you know, but maybe others don't, which is, and why it makes the Shema the most important prayer, and why we spoke about Shira being a critical point in order to receive the Torah. So we see that oneness exists, you know, to be able to visualize and experience that oneness. So Shema Yisrael, right? Hero Israel. The Lord is our God. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Now, Elokeinu is, as we know, the manifestation of Godliness, how it's experienced in the physical world. Obviously, there's only one God. But there's God, how he's expressed in the physical world. And then there's God, which is Yudke Vavkai, Adonai Echad. God, how he's, you know, greater than this physical world. That is, the light is too big for this world. It's before he, the, the, uh, he um, diminishes himself, so to speak, in order for us to be able to receive that level of godliness. And sometimes in life, when we go around, we think about, you know, What's going on in our life, maybe right now, people are experiencing difficulties and challenges. And we always think about, you know, if Hashem would only be able to help me, you know, and he, we, you know, we'd be able to reach this higher experience of godliness, everything would be okay. So the Shema says, Shema Yisrael, listen, Israel. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, the same God that you think about that's greater and above and can change all these and create all these miracles. It's the very same God that you're experiencing every second that you can breathe. In other words, it isn't, it isn't outside you. The oneness is we're talking about, ain't over, there's nothing besides him. It's inside of us, outside of us, in our prayer, in the prayer book, outside the prayer book. It's all godliness. And um, I just thought about that teaching that's from the Altar Rebbe, from the Kutte Torah, which, um, which also, you know, the fact that you brought the Shema into the Shira, I thought was a good opportunity for me to share that Torah as well. So we have a, 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 even perhaps a richer experience of the Shema in the Shira coming all together. But I say we open up for questions. Yes, well, thank you for the complimentary comments. Complimentary and complete with an E. If, any, if people have questions, comments, or reflections, we're more than happy to entertain them. On anything. Could be the Shoah, could be, tu, tu, you know, could be uh, Tu B'Shvat, could be the Shira, splitting of the Red Sea. Any comments or clarifications? Frequently, as I mentioned, the first person is embarrassed to go. So if the second person would just speak up, we, we should have no problem. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a comment. Um, I just thought it was cool. This morning's Daf Yomi was um, 
about like lepers being needing to isolate and to go to be sent out. And that just seemed to be kind of interesting parallel for the, the, this week's Torah portion about being sent away and this kind of thing. Um, well, it's, you know, it's interesting. There's a word in the, in the Torah reading when Pharaoh says, I'm going to send out, and the word is kaf lamed hay. Kaf lamed hay. Yeah. Now, most people take kaf lamed hay, and they think it means kula, which means everybody, everything, kula. But the letters kaf lamed hay also spell the word for bride. And the words of the expulsion from Egypt, the two words that the Torah uses, are the same two words for divorce. Bishamach, right? Bishamach is what a person does when a person divorces his wife. And it says, Vayigaresh, and he will expel you. Remarkable. So it could be that they've chose the language to mean that Israel is not just leaving Egypt, but they are divorced from Egypt. Now, according to Jewish law, if you divorce a wife, and the wife remarries, you're not allowed to marry her again. You can't take her back. You're encouraged for a couple to, to reconsider and come back to each other as long as they've not been with someone else. Once they have, they can't be back. So in Egypt, the argument goes, they were forced to worship the gods of Egypt. Once they leave Egypt and become, as it were, married to God, they are divorced from previously, and therefore can't go back. It's a remarkable idea, which means we just didn't leave, geographically speaking. It's like a divorce. And we left what? Forever. Now, this idea of the Mitzvah, so it could be the connection with the Mitzvah you're making, is that people of isolation. The difference in the Mitzvah is, I always think this is remarkable. If a person has Tzorat, which we say in English is leprosy, but we don't know if they really are the same. Who checks them all the time? Cohen. The Cohen. Now think about this. Normally, when you have skin diseases, what do people do when they see a skin disease? They run away. In other words, it, cre it creates a horror. This guy's a skin disease. Everybody almost automatically does what? Sidesteps him, doesn't want to get it within his Dalit Amot. Who has to visit him all the time? The coin. So this guy says, everybody's abandoned me, but who pays attention to me and has to make a regular visit to see if things are getting worse or not better is what? The coin. So we're saying a person who gets socially isolated, what's the Jewish solution? Take the most important person and visit him. Now follow closely. Why do you get sick at skin disease? Because when the skin shrivels, it reminds you of someone dying. And when someone is dying, some people do what? They avoid the presence. Now who is not around to be when a person dies? A, a coin. coin. You get it? So if the coin has to visit him, that's the best affirmation that this guy's not what? He's dying. He's not dying. It's only a temporary situation. And therefore what? He's really what? Back on the, dry, the direction toward living. So the presence of the coin, I think, will socially and psychologically salvage the person who's been isolated and therefore lead to his reintegration in the community when the skin disease heals up. It's remarkable. Fantastic. Fantastic tie-in. I want to I wanna add to that. That was great. That when we talk about someone who's being isolated as a Mitzora, so the idea is that they need to go through a transformation. Something was going on in their world, something's going on in their life, and, and they need some healing. And they need healing, like Rebuin pointed out, not because they're dying. It's not a step backwards. It's actually, you know, <laughs> one step back to take two steps forward. So it's like a healing process, it's like going to the doctor. It's like getting a, going through some, some kind of therapy. And the only time that needs to happen is because obviously something is going on. By the way, in terms of the, the name leprosy, the reason why I don't think it's a good name is because the Torah is pretty clear that this is a spiritual disease. It's a spiritual disease that happens physically on the body. How that works out, in other words, it's not a medical issue. It's a spiritual issue that's played out physically. We, we have this in Torah. So that's, a, you know, that's in terms of the actual name for it. So very much so, this is what's we're going, th going on. To have two, it says it's, it's easy, to, maybe not that easy, but it's easier to take the Jew out of Egypt than it is to take Egypt out of the Jew. Uh -huh. so, so out of 210 years of slavery, we do need to go through our transformation. We do, do need to go through a splitting of the Red Sea. We do need to go through 
our own healing in order to be ready, to be prepared, to be to, to embrace the Torah. And it's not so simple. We all know it's not so simple. 3,000 years later, you know, it's like, uh, forget it. The, you know, mo most major religions, whether it's Christianity or Islam, can get more comfortable with the fact that the Jews are the people of the book or the chosen people. But the Jews have a big problem with this, as we know. Yet, it's something that we need to deal with. We need to grow into in a way that's respectful, of course, to our, our neighbors. But this is all part of, you know, the healing process of when we say when we left Egypt, this is, what, this is the point that, that I remembered in terms of Mitzora. We go, it's not that we're in isolation. In that way, it's not a good comparison. But we do take on our own identity. And we take it on forever. No matter what happens. You talk about today's, you know, Yom HaShoah, right? Or International Remembrance, Remembrance Day. You know, this is another sad moment. We should have happy moments that we're reminded you're unique. You know, it's in a negative way, but and the world knows it, and, and we know it, but we need to remember that we should be unique to make the world a better place and to heal the world with what we with our uniqueness. And uh, I think once we do that, we'll, we'll it'll be more happy days ahead of us as opposed to God forbid the opposite. Any other questions, comments, or reflections? I have a question, and I have kind of a comment. Um, so uh, I've always wondered what's the difference between the first mi mi chamocha and the second mi chamocha, and how can a phrase like that, you know, you were you talking about gratitude and, and and so much praise, be followed by what like another three aliot of kvetching and mana, and it's not good enough. It's only it's, it's not just three aliot. It's 3,000 years of fetching. Well, right, right. We became professionals. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you... Well, your question is, why are Jews kvetching? Well, first is the, just the difference between the first mikamocha and the second mikamocha. There, it seems like there's something grammatic goal going on. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's repeated, and we don't tend to repeat things um, for no reason. Um, and then, yeah, on a, on a deeper level, how could it be that we're so grateful and then immediately, I mean, I know that there's lots of examples of this, um, you know, throughout, throughout at least Torah, um, but, you know, there's, we have lots of kind of repetition going on, right? There's Paro, whose heart continues to be hardened, and, um, you know, we, um, wavering, you know, we, we let them go, and then we come back, and not so fast, and likewise, uh, with the Yidden, um, we uh, were so grateful, but then we turn around and we're, we're not quite so grateful anymore. So kind of part one is just the grammatical, is there is there something going on with mi, mi, ka, mi ha mocha and mi ka mocha? And then what does it mean that we're, that we're wavering? I mean, pretty much like Paro. First, uh, I'm sure you noticed that in the, in the uh, Az Yashir, we have another language which is repeated, Ad Yavor Am Chashem, Ad Yavor Am Zukanita. In fact, we have three places of repetition. So that is apparently part of the structure of the song. Now, why people, I don't think you Jews have a, um, a, a monopoly on this, why people can reach special heights of gratitude toward God, and when things go wrong, to start complaining again, as far as I know, Jews, Jews do not have a monopoly upon it. It's part of human nature. In fact, sometimes the more you're given, the more likely you are to complain. In fact, when do the Jews in, in the Midbar complain the most? When they get the most. So, for example, there's a remarkable comment by Rashi, which says, <clears throat> when he gave them the man, it was called Lechem Klokeo. What is Klokeo? So, so Rashi says, the reason they complained is because the man was totally healthy. Since it was totally healthy, there was no refuse. And therefore, people could not defecate. It's a remarkable comment. It's almost Freudian. And therefore, since they could not defecate, rather than thanking God for giving such wonderful food, they complain because they couldn't feel relief. My point is, if you want to complain, I guarantee you, you have a reason to complain. So if you get amazing, if you think of Rashi's comment, you give person the best food in the world, what do they complain about? My body totally absorbs it. It's totally healthy. Mm -hmm. I cannot, what? Experience that relief. Okay? Now, what's remarkable, though, is right after this comes Amalek. And some people perceive Amalek as an expression 
to the lack of Jewish gratitude or to the lack of Jewish faith. So the, the first Lubavitch Rebbe on the phrase, Hayesh Hashem Bekerbenu Im Ayin, is God among us Ayin? Now Ayin means normally is God among us or not? And then it says, Vayavu Amalek. So Amalek attacked at a moment of the absence of Jewish faith. No matter how much God did for them. And despite the fact that it says, Vayamina Vashem Moshev Do, that they believed in God and Moses' servant, when things went rough, some of them did what? Lost their faith. So the Chabad translate, Im Yesh Hashem Beinu, or is God Ayin? Now, ayin does not mean nothing. Enough ayin stands for the ain sof, the infinite. And here is a remarkable teaching of Chabad, which, which um, Mesh just mentioned. Uh, if I taught you this teaching a couple hundred years ago, you wouldn't believe it. But if I tell you now that all the world is composed of the same atomic structure and the same molecules and therefore the same protons and the same electrons, and the same neutrons, and not even the small particle, participate in all reality, and therefore all reality is based upon the same thing. It just looks different to us because a different structure. You'd say, oh, I know that. So it comes along the Alter Rebbe and says, in actuality, all material reality is permeated by divinity. That's why God is called Koach HaMahave. He just didn't create things and leave them alone, like drawing a picture and it stands on its own God's relationship to the world is like electricity to a bulb it has to constantly recharge it if the electricity stops flowing the bulb goes out so God's Koch Mahave is like a source of energy and the whole world exists by virtue of divinity within it it takes on different shapes we don't all recognize it but there's a famous story of the Alta Rebbe where he was actually holding a standard how do you say standard in English? Podium. Lectern. Lectern or podium. Yeah, right. I think the story goes. Maybe you correct me, please, Mesh, if I'm wrong. Anyway, and he said, I was, as I was holding it, I could feel what? The divinity surging through it. In other words, he, was a, he had the ability to get beyond the material and to feel the divinity in everything. So in one sense, the whole world is really composed of the same thing, which is divinity. It takes on different structures. But we all know that from molecules and from atoms. Now, don't forget the word atom, A-T-O-M, means not splittable. A, without, tom in Greek is to cut. You can't cut anymore. You're at the basic element. And now we know what? What's composed of three elements. And now we even know those are composed of elements. So almost like infinity goes down to smallness, corresponds to infinity going up to greatness. And we're beginning to realize to what degree our world is so well structured to believe that there wasn't a designer believe it, I mean, the designer to create it, it to me is incredible. Um, Ruben, I want to just, if I may, just give a closing thought because uh, I, I, every time you speak, I think of more Torah, but I, I would say like this, in addition, just adding to what you, what you shared, and this hopefully answers Jordan's question, both in terms of complaining. Well, as we said, the Micha Mocha is maybe representative of, as, as Rebuven said, as the Shema, right? The key cardinal prayer in all of Judaism, the Shema. We have in the Tefillin, we have in the Mezuzah, we have it. Everybody knows the Shema is the most important prayer in all of Judaism. And so that's reflected by way of Micha Mocha. So why it's repetition? I don't have that answer right now. Um, we have a rhythm going on there. Obviously, there's a reason for everything, especially when there's repetition, but I don't have the answer. So it's homework for all of us. But in terms of how God manifests himself, as Reuben said, we also say a prayer several times. It says, That in his goodness, he renews every single day. It says renews. He didn't renew 5,000, you know, 780 years ago, but he renews every single second. It doesn't just happen once. Why am I bringing this in? Because when we understand that God is renewing every second, our life, our existence, our ability to breathe, the next breath, the next breath, the next breath, it's all God allowing it to happen, then we complain a little bit less. <laughs> the problem is that we forget that. And we forget that he's renewing. We think that he created it. And now we're upset why he created our experience. And if only he created our experience differently, we, we, we would feel better about it. But no, every second he's creating it. So in the spirit of going through the, the language, 
It says that right after the Shira, it says, marasa. They came to a place called Marasa. Mayim. They couldn't drink the water. Mimara. From here, Kimorim Haim. Because it was bitter. And there's a teaching on this that it wasn't the water that was bitter. Another play on words. Kimorim Haim. That they were bitter. They were in They didn't have the gratitude. They didn't have a certain gratefulness. So because they were bitter, so therefore everything tasted bitter. So just real quick, the, the, the joke about the guy, he was complaining. He, he didn't have any, he was thirsty. I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. screaming around town, he's thirsty. Someone finally gives him a glass of water and quenches his thirst. Sure enough, the next day he wakes up running around town. Oh, was I thirsty? Oh, was I thirsty? Was I, was I thirsty? If we understand that Hashem is experiencing and allowing our world to exist every second and every part of our experience every second, We'll never have. Any, there's a lot in this parsha, Jordan. Don't get me wrong. I thought you. I think you bring up a, a very some good stuff over here. We have sarcasm in this por, in this Torah portion. Where there's not enough grave sites in, in Egypt, you have to bury us here. How could Jews talk like that? He just saved them, you know. But it goes to show us, and I, perhaps that's why the Torah teaches us is to remember. Maybe we can take this in in our moment that we are in many ways living the greatest times in our life with the pandemic. As crazy as that may sound to you, as crazy as. Because we all have the ability to have food and running water and heat. And yet we can find ourselves complaining very, very fast. And hopefully this will be over soon and it'll look, we'll have even, even a greater appreciation for life. So maybe that's one of the great teachings that this Torah portion is teaching us that not only to be free, but God is making us free. He continues to make us free forever. And Lachaim, everybody, happy to be shvat and let us Amen. never. Amen. Lachaim, right? Make sure you eat all different types of fruits. I say a brook on each one of them. Right. And a special emphasis on the fruits of the uh Rebuven, you want to tell us what the Shavu Minin is? Or at least... So, Ra Geffen Teinav Um We have the uh, Geffen, I mean, the, the fruit. I mean, we have spelt and wheat. Right. But the main thing is the uh, the wine and the dates and the figs and the grapes. Those are the fruits. Pomegranate? And the pomegranate, the Rimon. Geffen, it's called Geffen, the lesser Geffen, grapes, Taina, um, figs, Rimon, pomegranates. And I just heard a vort from a, my, my chazan in my synagogue who said that if you think about it, these things all produce something very valuable to us. So Mechem, I mean, out of Chita, we get what? Bread. Bread with the staff of life. Out of grapes, we get what? Wine. And Tmarim are dates. And out of dates, someone said, we get shiduchim. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> I mean, by the way, Tuba Shvat is about that. I just read, <laughs> no, I just right? read today that there's the thinking of those who are barren can have, will have children, and those who need shiduchim can have. It, it, it talks about that progress, the fruit, to be fruitful. Very good. Okay, may we all be fruitful and multiply. Shkoch, everybody. Stay Amen. safe. We'll see you soon. Shalom, shalom. Hope to see you again in two weeks for today. Amen. Amen.